Chapter 44 Jamie The new lord of River Run was so angry that he was shaking. We have been deceived, he said. This man has played us false! Pink spittle flew from his lips as he jabbed a finger at Edmure Tully. I will have his head off. I rule in River Run by the king's own decree. I am an, said his wife. The Lord Commander knows about the king's decree. Sir Edmure knows about the king's decree. The stable boys know about the king's decree. I am the Lord, and I will have his head. For what crime? Thin as he was, Edmure still looked more lordly than Emmon Frey. He wore a quilted doublet of red wool with a leaping trout embroidered on its chest. His boots were black, his breeches blue. His auburn hair had been washed and barbered, his red beard neatly trimmed. I did all that was asked of me. Oh? Jamie Lannister had not slept since Riverrun had opened its gates, and his head was pounding. I do not recall asking you to let Sir Brynden escape. You required me to surrender my castle, not my uncle. Am I to blame if your men let him slip through their siege lines? Jamie was not amused. Where is he? he said, letting his irritation show. His men had searched River Run thrice over, and Brynden Tully was nowhere to be found. He never told me where he meant to go, and you never asked. How did he get out? Fish swim, even black ones. Edmure smiled. Jamie was sorely tempted to crack him across the mouth with his golden hand. A few missing teeth would put an end to his smiles. For a man who was going to spend the rest of his life a prisoner, Edmure was entirely too pleased with himself. We have oubliettes beneath Casterly Rock that fit a man as tight as a suit of armor. You can't turn in them, or sit, or reach down to your feet when the rats start gnawing at your toes. Would you care to reconsider that answer? Lord Edmure's smile went away. You gave me your word that I would be treated honorably as befits my rank. So you shall, said Jamie. Nobler knights than you have died whimpering in those oubliettes, and many a high lord, too. Even a king or two, if I recall my history. Your wife can have the one beside you if you like. I would not want to part you. He did swim, said Edmure, sullenly. He had the same blue eyes as his sister Catelyn, and Jamie saw the same loathing there that he'd once seen in hers. We raised the portcullis on the water gate. Not all the way, just three feet or so. Enough to leave a gap under the water though the gates still appeared to be closed. My uncle is a strong swimmer. After dark, he pulled himself beneath the spikes. And he slipped under our boom the same way, no doubt. A moonless night, bored guards, a black fish in a black river floating quietly downstream. If Rudiger or you or any of their men heard a splash, they would put it down to a turtle or a trout. Edmure had waited most of the day before hauling down the dire wolf of Stark in a token of surrender. In the confusion of the castle changing hands, it had been the next morning before Jamie had been informed that the black fish was not amongst the prisoners. He went to the window and gazed out over the river. It was a bright autumn day, and the sun was shining on the waters. By now, the black fish could be ten leagues downstream. You have to find him! insisted Emmon Frey. He'll be found. Jamie spoke with a certainty he did not feel. I have hounds and hunters sniffing after him even now. Sir Adam Marbrand was leading the search on the south side of the river, Sir Dermot of the Rainwood on the north. He had considered enlisting the river lords as well, but Vance and Piper and their ilk were more like to help the blackfish escape than clap him into fetters. All in all, he was not hopeful. He may elude us for a time, he said, but eventually he must resurface. What if he should try and take my castle back? You have a garrison of two hundred. Too large a garrison in truth, but Lord Emmon had an anxious disposition. At least you would have no trouble feeding them. 
The blackfish had left River unamply provisioned, just as he had claimed. After the trouble Sir Brynden took to leave us, I doubt that he'll come skulking back. Unless it is at the head of a band of outlaws. He did not doubt that the blackfish meant to continue the fight. This is your seat, Lady Jenna told her husband. It is for you to hold it. If you cannot do that, put it to the torch and run back to the rock. Lord Emmon rubbed his mouth. His hand came away red and slimy from the sour leaf. To be sure, a river run is mine, and no man shall ever take it from me. He gave Edmure Tully one last suspicious look, as Lady Jenna drew him from the solar. Is there any more that you would care to tell me? Jamie asked Edmure when the two of them were alone. This was my father's seat, said Tully. He ruled the riverlands from here, wisely and well. He liked to sit beside that window. The light was good there, and whenever he looked up from his work, he could see the river. When his eyes were tired, he would have Cat read to him. Littlefinger and I built a castle out of wooden blocks once, there beside the door. You will never know how sick it makes me to see you in this room, Kingslayer. You will never know how much I despise you. He was wrong about that. I have been despised by better men than you, Edmure. Jamie called for a guard. Take his lordship back to his tower and see that he's fed. The Lord of River Run went silently. On the morrow, he would start west. Sir Forley Prester would command his escort, a hundred men, including twenty knights. Best double that. Lord Barrick may try to free Edmure before they reach the Golden Tooth. Jamie did not want to have to capture Tully for a third time. He returned to Hoster Tully's chair, pulled over the map of the trident, and flattened it beneath his golden hand. Where would I go if I were the Blackfish? Lord Commander, a guardsman stood in the open door. Lady Westerling and her daughter are without, as you commanded. Jamie shoved the map aside. Show them in. At least the girl did not vanish, too. Jane Westerling had been Rob Stark's queen, the girl who cost him everything. With a wolf in her belly, she could have proved more dangerous than the blackfish. She did not look dangerous. Jane was a willowy girl, no more than fifteen or sixteen, more awkward than graceful. She had narrow hips, breasts the size of apples, a mop of chestnut curls, and the soft brown eyes of a doe. Pretty enough for a child, Jamie decided, but not a girl to lose a kingdom for. Her face was puffy, and there was a scab on her forehead, half hidden by a lock of brown hair. What happened there? he asked her. The girl turned her head away. It is nothing, insisted her mother, a stern-faced woman in a gown of green velvet. A necklace of golden seashells looped about her long, thin neck. She would not give up the little crown the rebel gave her, and when I tried to take it from her head, the willful child fought me. It was mine, Jane sobbed. You had no right. Rob made it for me. I loved him. Her mother made to slap her, but Jamie stepped between them. None of that, he warned Lady Sybil. Sit down, both of you. The girl curled up in her chair like a frightened animal, but her mother sat stiffly, her head high. Will you have wine? he asked them. The girl did not answer. No, thank you, said her mother. As you will. Jamie turned to the daughter. I'm sorry for your loss. The boy had courage. I'll give him that. There is a question I must ask you. Are you carrying his child, my lady? Jane burst from her chair and would have fled the room if the guard at the door had not seized her by the arm. She is not, said Lady Sybil, as her daughter struggled to escape. I made certain of that, as your lord father bid me. Jamie nodded. Tywin Lannister was not a man to overlook such details. Unhand the girl, he said. I'm done with her for now. As Jane fled sobbing down the stairs, he considered her mother. House Westerling has its pardon, 
and your brother Rolf has been made Lord of Castamere. What else would you have of us? Your Lord Father promised me worthy marriages for Jane and her younger sister. Lords or heirs, he swore to me, not younger sons nor household knights. Lords or heirs, to be sure. The Westerlings were an old house, and proud. But Lady Sybil herself had been born a spicer from a line of upjumped merchants. Her grandmother had been some sort of half-mad witch-woman from the East, he seemed to recall, and the Westerlings were impoverished. Younger sons would have been the best that Sybil Spicer's daughters could have hoped for in the ordinary course of events, but a nice fat pot of Lannister gold would make even a dead rebel's widow look attractive to some lord. "'You'll have your marriages,' said Jamie. "'But Jane must wait two full years before she weds again.' If the girl took another husband too soon and had a child by him, inevitably there would come whispers that the young wolf was the father. "'I have two sons as well,' Lady Westerling reminded him. "'Rollam is with me, but Reynold was a knight and went with the rebels to the twins. If I had known what was to happen there, I would never have allowed that.' There was a hint of reproach in her voice. "'Reynold knew not of any—' "'of the understanding with your lord father. "'He may be a captive at the twins.' "'Or he may be dead. "'Walter Frey would not have known of the understanding, either. "'I will make inquiries. "'If Sir Reynold is still a captive, we'll pay his ransom for you. "'Mention was made of a match for him as well. "'A bride from Casterly Rock. "'Your lord father said that Reynold should have joy of him "'if all went as we hoped. Even from the grave, Lord Tywin's dead hand moves us all. Joy is my late Uncle Garion's natural daughter. A betrothal can be arranged, if that is your wish, but any marriage will need to wait. Joy was nine or ten when last I saw her. His natural daughter? Lady Sybil looked as if she had swallowed a lemon. You want a westerling to wed a bastard? No more than I want Joy to marry the son of some scheming turncloak bitch. She deserves better. Jamie would happily have strangled the woman with her seashell necklace. Joy was a sweet child, albeit a lonely one. Her father had been Jamie's favorite uncle. Your daughter is worth ten of you, my lady. You'll leave with Edmure and Sir Forley on the morrow. Until then, you would do well to stay out of my sight. He shouted for a guardsman, and Lady Sybil went off with her lips pressed primly together. Jamie had to wonder how much Lord Gowan knew about his wife's scheming. How much do we men ever know? When Edmure and the Westerlings departed, four hundred men rode with them. Jamie had doubled the escort again at the last moment. He rode with them a few miles to talk with Sir Forley Prester. Though he bore a bull's head upon his surcoat and horns upon his helm, Sir Forley could not have been less bovine. He was a short, spare, hard-bitten man. With his pinched nose, bald pate, and grizzled brown beard, he looked more like an innkeep than a knight. "'We don't know where the blackfish is,' Jamie reminded him. "'But if he can cut Edmure free, he will. "'That will not happen, my lord.' Like most innkeeps, Sir Forley was no man's fool. Scouts and outriders will screen our march— and will fortify our camps by night. I have picked ten men to stay with Tully day and night, my best longbowmen. If he should ride so much as a foot off the road, they will lose so many shafts at him that his own mother would take him for a goose. Good. Jamie would as lief have Tully reach Casterly Rock safely, but better dead than fled. Best keep some archers near Lord Westerling's daughter as well. Sir Forley seemed taken aback. Gawain's girl? She's the young wolf's widow, Jamie finished, and twice as dangerous as Edmure if she were ever to escape us. As you say, my lord, she will be watched. Jamie had to canter past the westerlings as he rode down the column on his way back to River Run. Lord Gawain nodded gravely as he passed, but Lady Sybil looked through him with eyes like chips of ice. Jane never saw him at all. The widow rode with downcast eyes, huddled beneath a hooded cloak. Underneath its heavy folds, her clothes were finely made, but torn. 
She ripped them herself as a mark of mourning, Jamie realized. That could not have pleased her mother. He found himself wondering if Cersei would tear her gown if she should ever hear that he was dead. He did not go straight back to the castle, but crossed the tumblestone once more to call on Edwin Frey and discuss the transfer of his great-grandfather's prisoners. The Frey host had begun to break up within hours of River Run surrender, as Lord Walder's bannermen and free riders pulled up stakes to make for home. The Freys who still remained were striking camp, but he found Edwin with his bastard uncle in the latter's pavilion. The two of them were huddled over a map, arguing heatedly, but they broke off when Jamie entered. "'Lord Commander,' Rivers said with cold courtesy, but Edwin blurted out, "'My father's blood is on your hands, sir!' That took Jamie a bit aback. "'How so?' "'You were the one who sent him home, were you not?' "'Someone had to. Has some ill befallen Sir Ryman?' "'Hanged with all his party,' said Walter Rivers." The outlaws caught them two leagues south of Fair Market. Dundarian? Him? Or Thoros? Or this woman Stoneheart? Jamie frowned. Ryman Frey had been a fool, a craven, and a sot, and no one was like to miss him much, least of all his fellow Freys. If Edwin's dry eyes were any clue, even his own sons would not mourn him long. Still... These outlaws are growing bold if they dare hang Lord Walder's heir not a day's ride from the twins. How many men did Sir Ryman have with him? he asked. Three knights and a dozen men at arms, said Rivers. It is almost as if they knew that he would be returning to the twins and with a small escort. Edwin's mouth twisted. My brother had a hand in this, I'll wager. He allowed the outlaws to escape after they murdered Merritt and Peter, and this is why. With our father dead, there's only me left between Black Walder and the twins. You have no proof of this, said Walder Rivers. I do not need proof. I know my brother. Your brother is at sea, God, Rivers insisted. How could he have known that Sir Ryman was returning to the twins? "'Someone told him,' said Edwin in a bitter tone. "'He has spies in our camp, you can be sure.' "'And you have yours at Seaguard. "'Jamie knew that the enmity between Edwin and Black Walder ran deep, "'but cared not a fig which of them succeeded their great-grandfather as Lord of the Crossing. "'If you will pardon me for intruding on your grief,' he said in a dry tone, "'we have other matters to consider.' When you return to the twins, please inform Lord Walder that King Tommen requires all the captives you took at the Red Wedding. Sir Walder frowned. These prisoners are valuable, sir. His grace would not ask for them if they were worthless. Frey and Rivers exchanged a look. Edwin said, My lord grandfather will expect recompense for these prisoners. And he'll have it, as soon as I grow a new hand, thought Jamie. We all have expectations, he said mildly. Tell me, is Sir Reynold Westerling amongst these captives? The Knight of Seashells, Edwin sneered. You'll find that one feeding the fish at the bottom of the green fork. He was in the yard when our men came to put the dire wolf down, said Walter Rivers. Wayland demanded his sword and he gave it over meek enough. But when the crossbowmen began feathering the wolf, he seized Wayland's axe and cut the monster loose of the net they'd thrown over him. Wayland says he took a quarrel in his shoulder and another in the gut, but still managed to reach the wall walk and throw himself into the river. He left a trail of blood on the steps, said Edwin. Did you find his corpse afterward? asked Jamie. We found a thousand corpses afterward. Once they've spent a few days in the river, they all look much the same. I've heard the same is true of hanged men, said Jamie, before he took his leave. By the next morning, little remained of the Frey encampment but flies, horse dung, and Sir Ryman's gallows, standing forlorn beside the tumblestone. His cause wanted to know what should be done with it, and with the siege equipment he had built, his rams and sows and towers and trebuchets. 
Davin proposed that they drag it all to Raven Tree and use it there. Jamie told him to put everything to the torch, starting with the gallows. I mean to deal with Lord Tidos myself. It won't require a siege tower. Davin grinned through his bushy beard. Single combat cause? Scarce seems fair. Tidos is an old gray man. An old gray man with two hands. That night, he and Sir Illyn fought for three hours. It was one of his better nights. If they had been in earnest, Payne would only have killed him twice. Half a dozen deaths were more the rule, and some nights were worse than that. If I keep at this for another year, I may be as good as Peck, Jamie declared, and Sir Illyn made that clacking sound that meant he was amused. Come, let's drink some more of Hoster Tully's good red wine. Wine had become a part of their nightly ritual. Sir Illyn made the perfect drinking companion. He never interrupted, never disagreed, never complained or asked for favors or told long, pointless stories. All he did was drink and listen. "'I should have the tongues removed from all my friends,' said Jamie as he filled their cups, "'and from my kin as well. A silent Circe would be sweet, though I'd miss her tongue when we kissed.' He drank. The wine was a deep red, sweet and heavy. It warmed him going down. "'I can't remember when we first began to kiss. "'It was innocent at first, until it wasn't. "'He finished the wine and set his cup aside. "'Tyrion once told me that most whores will not kiss you. "'They'll fuck you blind,' he said, "'but you'll never feel their lips on yours. "'Do you think my sister kisses Kettleback?' "'Sir Illyn did not answer. "'I don't think it would be proper for me to slay mine own sworn brother.' What I need to do is geld him and send him to the wall. That's what they did with Lucamor the Lusty. Sir Osmond may not take kindly to the gelding, to be sure. And there are his brothers to consider. Brothers can be dangerous. After Aegon the Unworthy put Sir Terence Toyne to death for sleeping with his mistress, Toyne's brothers did their best to kill him. Their best was not quite good enough, thanks to the Dragon Knight. But it was not for want of trying. It's written down in the White Book. All of it, save what to do with Circe. Sir Illyn drew a finger across his throat. No, said Jamie. Tommen has lost a brother, and the man he thought of as his father. If I were to kill his mother, he would hate me for it. And that sweet little wife of his would find a way to turn that hatred to the benefit of Highgarden. Sir Illyn smiled in a way Jamie did not like. An ugly smile. An ugly soul. You talk too much, he told the man. The next day, Sir Dermot of the Rainwood returned to the castle, empty-handed. When asked what he'd found, he answered, Wolves. Hundreds of the bloody buggers. He'd lost two sentries to them. The wolves had come out of the dark to savage them. Armed men in mail and boiled leather, and yet the beasts had no fear of them. Before he died, Jate said the pack was led by a she-wolf of monstrous size. A dire wolf, to hear him tell it. The wolves got in amongst our horse lines, too. The bloody bastards killed my favorite bay. A ring of fires round your camp might keep them off, said Jamie. Though he wondered, could Sir Dermot's dire wolf be the same beast that had mauled Joffrey near the crossroads? Wolves or no, Sir Dermot took fresh horses and more men and went out again the next morning to resume the search for Brynden Tully. That same afternoon, the lords of the Trident came to Jaime asking his leave to return to their own lands. He granted it. Lord Piper also wanted to know about his son Mark. All the captives will be ransomed, Jaime promised. As the river lords took their leave, Lord Carol Vance lingered to say, Lord Jaime... You must go to Raven Tree. So long as it is Jonos at his gates, Tidos will never yield. But I know he will bend his knee for you. Jamie thanked him for his counsel. Strongbore was the next to depart. He wanted to return to Derry as he'd promised and fight the outlaws. We rode across half the bloody realm, and for what? So you could make Edmure Tully piss his breeches? There's no song in that. I need a fight! I want the hound, Jamie. Him or the marcher lord. 
The hound's head is yours if you can take it, Jamie said. But Beric Dondarrion is to be captured alive, so he can be brought back to King's Landing. A thousand people need to see him die or else he won't stay dead. Strongbore grumbled at that, but finally agreed. The next day he departed with his squire and men-at-arms, plus beardless John Bedley, who had decided that hunting outlaws was preferable to returning to his famously homely wife. Supposedly she had the beard that Bedley lacked. Jamie still had the garrison to deal with. To a man, they swore that they knew nothing of Sir Brynden's plans or where he might have gone. They are lying, Emmon Frey insisted, but Jamie thought not. If you share your plans with no one, no one can betray you, he pointed out. Lady Jenna suggested that a few of the men might be put to the question. He refused. I gave Edmure my word that if he yielded, the garrison could leave unharmed. That was chivalrous of you, his aunt said. But it's strength that's needed here, not chivalry. Ask Edmure how chivalrous I am, thought Jamie. Ask him about the trebuchet. Somehow he did not think the maesters were like to confuse him with Prince Amon the Dragon Knight when they wrote their histories. Still, he felt curiously content. The war was all but won. Dragonstone had fallen, and Storm's End would soon enough, he could not doubt. And Stannis was welcome to the Wall. The Northmen would love him no more than the Storm Lords had. If Roose Bolton did not destroy him, Winter would. Andy had done his own part here at River Run without actually ever taking up arms against the Starks or Tullys. Once he found the Blackfish, he would be free to return to King's Landing, where he belonged. My place is with the King. With my son. Would Tommen want to know that? The truth could cost the boy his throne. Would you sooner have a father or a chair, lad? Jamie wished he knew the answer. He does like stamping papers with his seal. The boy might not even believe him, to be sure. Cersei would say it was a lie. My sweet sister, the deceiver. He would need to find some way to winkle Tommen from her clutches before the boy became another Joffrey. And whilst at that, he should find the lad a new small council, too. If Cersei can be put aside, Sir Kevon may agree to serve as Tommen's hand. And if not, well, the Seven Kingdoms did not lack for able men. Forley Prester would make a good choice, or Roland Craycall. If someone other than a Westerman was needed to appease the Tyrells, there was always Mathis Rowan, or even Peter Baelish. Littlefinger was as amiable as he was clever, but too lowborn to threaten any of the great lords, with no swords of his own. The perfect hand. The Tully garrison departed the next morning, stripped of all their arms and armor, each man was allowed three days' food and the clothing on his back, after he swore a solemn oath never to take up arms against Lord Emmon or House Lannister. "'If you're fortunate, one man in ten may keep that vow,' Lady Jenna said. "'Good. I'd sooner face nine men than ten. The tenth might have been the one who would have killed me. The other nine will kill you just as quick. Better that than die in bed. Or on the privy.' Two men did not choose to depart with the others. Sir Desmond Grell, Lord Hoster's old master-at-arms, preferred to take the black. So did Sir Robin Ryger, Riverrun's captain of the guards. "'This castle's been my home for forty years,' said Grell. "'You say I'm free to go. But where? I'm too old and too stout to make a hedge knight. But men are always welcome at the wall.' "'As you wish,' said Jamie." though it was a bloody nuisance. He allowed them to keep their arms and armor, and assigned a dozen of Gregor Clegane's men to escort the two of them to Maidenpool. The command he gave to Rayford, the one he, they called the Sweetling. See to it that the prisoners reach Maidenpool unspoiled, he told the man. Or what Sir Gregor did to the goat will seem a jolly lark compared to what I'll do to you. More days passed. Lord Emmon assembled all of River Run in the yard, Lord Edmure's people and his own, and spoke to them for close on three hours about what would be expected of them now that he was their lord and master. From time to time he waved his parchment, as stable boys and serving girls and smiths listened in a sullen silence and a light rain fell down upon them all. The singer was listening too, 
the one that Jamie had taken from Sir Ryman Frey. Jamie came upon him standing inside an open door where it was dry. His lordship should have been a singer, the man said. This speech is longer than a marcher ballad, and I don't think he stopped for breath. Jamie had to laugh. Lord Emmon does not need to breathe so long as he can chew. Are you going to make a song of it? A funny one. I'll call it Talking to the Fish. Just don't play it where my aunt can hear. Jamie had never paid the man much mind before. He was a small fellow, garbed in ragged green breeches and a frayed tunic of a lighter shade of green, with brown leather patches covering the holes. His nose was long and sharp, his smile big and loose. Thin brown hair fell to his collar, snaggled and unwashed. Fifty if he's a day, thought Jamie. A hedge harp, and hard used by life. Weren't you Sir Ryman's man when I found you? he asked. Only for a fortnight. I would have expected you to depart with the phrase. That one up there's a fray, the singer said, nodding at Lord Emmon. And this castle seems a nice snug place to pass the winter. White Smile Watt went home with Sir Forley, so I thought I'd see if I could win his place. Watt's got that high, sweet voice that the likes of me can't hope to match. But I know twice as many body songs as he does, begging my lord's pardon. You should get on famously with my aunt, said Jamie. If you hope to winter here, see that your playing pleases Lady Jenna. She's the one that matters. Not you. My place is with the king. I shall not stay here long. I'm sorry to hear that, my lord. I know better songs than the reigns of Castamere. I could have played you... Oh, all sorts of things. Some other time, said Jamie. Do you have a name? Tom of Seven Streams, if it please, my lord. The singer doffed his hat. Most call me Thomas Evans, though. Sing sweetly, Thomas Evans. That night, he dreamt that he was back in the great sept of Baylor, still standing vigil over his father's corpse. The sept was still and dark, until a woman emerged from the shadows and walked slowly to the bier. Sister? he said. But it was not Circe. She was all in grey, a silent sister. A hood and veil concealed her features, but he could see the candles burning in the green pools of her eyes. Sister, he said, what would you have of me? His last word echoed up and down the sap. Me, 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 me. I am not your sister, Jamie. She raised a pale, soft hand and pushed her hood back. Have you forgotten me? Can I forget someone I never knew? The words caught in his throat. He did know her, but it had been so long. Will you forget your own Lord Father, too? I wonder if you ever knew him, truly. Her eyes were green, her hair spun gold. He could not tell how old she was. Fifteen, he thought, or fifty. She climbed the steps to stand above the bier. He could never abide being laughed at. That was the thing he hated most. Who are you? He had to hear her say it. The question is, who are you? This is a dream. Is it? She smiled sadly. Count your hands, child. One. One hand, clasped tight around the sword hilt. Only one. In my dreams, I always have two hands. He raised his right arm and stared uncomprehending at the ugliness of his stump. We all dream of things we cannot have. Tywin dreamed that his son would be a great knight. That his daughter would be a queen. He dreamed they would be so strong and brave and beautiful that no one would ever laugh at them. I am a knight, he told her. And Cersei is a queen. A tear rolled down her cheek. The woman raised her hood again and turned her back on him. Jamie called after her, but already she was moving away, her skirt whispering lullabies as it brushed across the floor. Don't leave me, he wanted to call. But of course she'd left them long ago. He woke in darkness, shivering. The room had grown cold as ice. Jamie flung aside the covers with the stump of his sword hand. 
The fire in the hearth had died, he saw, and the window had blown open. He crossed the pitch-dark chamber to fumble with the shutters, but when he reached the window, his bare foot came down in something wet. Jamie recoiled, startled for a moment. His first thought was of blood, but blood would not have been so cold. It was snow, drifting through the windows. Instead of closing the shutters, he threw them wide. The yard below was covered by a thin white blanket, growing thicker even as he watched. The merlins on the battlements wore white cowls. The flakes fell silently, a few drifting in the window to melt upon his face. Jamie could see his own breath. Snow in the Riverlands. If it was snowing here, it could well be snowing on Lannisport as well, and on King's Landing. Winter is marching south, and half our granaries are empty. Any crops still in the fields were doomed. There would be no more plantings, no more hopes of one last harvest. He found himself wondering what his father would do to feed the realm, before he remembered that Tywin Lannister was dead. When morning broke, the snow was ankle-deep, and deeper in the godswood, where drifts had piled up under the trees. Squires, stable boys, and highborn pages turned to children again under its cold white spell and fought a snowball war up and down the wards and all along the battlements. Jamie heard them laughing. There was a time, not long ago, when he might have been out making snowballs with the best of them, to fling at Tyrion when he waddled by, or slip down the back of Cersei's gown. You need two hands to make a decent snowball, though. There was a rap upon his door. See who that is, Peck. It was River Run's old maester, with a message clutched in his lined and wrinkled hand. Vyman's face was pale as the new-fallen snow. I know, Jamie said. There's been a white raven from the Citadel. Winter has come. No, my lord. The bird was from King's Landing. I took the liberty. I did not know. He held the letter out. Jamie read it in the window seat, bathed in the light of that cold white morning. Kyvern's words were terse and to the point, Circe's fevered and fervent. "'Come at once,' she said. "'Help me. Save me. I need you now as I have never needed you before. I love you. I love you. I love you. Come at once!' Vyman was hovering by the door, waiting, and Jamie sensed that Peck was watching too. "'Does my lord wish to answer?' the maester asked after a long silence. A snowflake landed on the letter. As it melted, the ink began to blur. Jamie rolled the parchment up again, as tight as one hand would allow, and handed it to Peck. No, he said. Put this in the fire. 